So we're going to continue review of images. Um, so basically different resolution, but the same type of images. Uh, just a different, different level of detail. And then on Wednesday, we're going to bring this uh, micro uh, to the sound. That way, we'll get some ideas of where these images are coming from. And the whole idea well, there are multiple ideas in this review. To what extent, once we get an image, still has a life on its own. He's trying to. Uh, from it. However, images are never perfect, and you also want to use them for the purpose. So the purpose of this review is for you to understand how images are taken, and actually also understand which type of transport phenomena you can capture. Because ultimately, you are not interested in just a piece. Okay? You're, interested, you're interested in some sort of transport phenomena that you want to see, and how to quantify it. And images always contain some level of error and some level of noise. So I can hear their sense of the picture. And you need to sometimes understand that the source of that error is both the order to improve the image down the line, especially if you are collaborating with somebody who is actually interested in it, and possibly you're using one yourself. You need to understand that what is the type of noise and how can you can. Um, so, we're not going to go into a lot of detail, but I, it, it, it's a little bit of a spin, like every three slides, which is the imaging uh, technique in this first initial overview. But I want you to understand uh, where images come from so you can deal with different issues that come of it. And also, imagine. So, as you go through your research, I want imaging to become a Actually, what could be done is they will easily find a facility for somebody to collaborate with us to do it, right? And you can also push uh, an envelope in that regard. Okay, so basic thing that we said is like, well, okay, uh, when we are, whenever we are imaging, we are actually using some type of, most of the time, um, some type of electromagnetic wave. Let me just double check. I did click to start the recording did I didn't I right let's make sure that I did yes I did okay so some sort of I'm essentially sending some sort of a wave and then recording interactions of that wave. Now I might have transparency in the work that my wave can pass. So, in this case, there is actually a force medium inside. There are gel beams that are transparent. They're intense match with light and with water. So, once they're in water, I don't see them. I actually see faintly some sort of uh, interfaces within, but I can see them faintly. And then I have glass beams that are not indexed and matched with water, so I can see them really well passing. So this is when I'm using light. I depend on transparency. And a number of imaging modalities use transparency. However, when I don't have transparency, because I have such an image, this is what we refer to as opacity, basically then I have to probe this up. And one way to throw this rock core is with the X-ray or MRI, or simply do a section, sort of polish the top of it, and do like microscopy uh, just on the top of the surface, so you can't necessarily go in. And another way is to just send a beam of electron, and there's going to be uh, electron microscopy for this, and electron microscopy. So once I don't have the transparency, so I can't go with the regular light microscopy or, or some sort of um, see through uh, then I have to go to X ray or bounce of electron 
these those are essentially options. Now, different mod modalities have developed around that. Uh, just a brief reminder that if I look at the electromagnetic spectrum, what I can image basically has to be commensurate with, with the wavelength of the telegraphy, uh, the, the wave that I'm sending at it. So if I look at my X-rays, this is the lab that we uh, visited. They're basically the soft rays, and they're typically a combination. We're going to go into a little bit of detail on that. They're typically polychromatic, so I don't have a range of X-ray uh, and range of wavelength, uh, wavelengths that are going through. The ones that are really monochromatic or really one type or one um, uh, wavelength of X-ray are those coming from uh, larger sources than we have here in downstairs. <laughs> so you'd have to go to national labs. Okay. So those are more powerful sources. Either way, uh, so I can, as you can see, basically probe down to microns and below uh, with X-rays, which is also useful for uh, for the petrophysics, because most of our well, samples are in the, the range sizes are in the range of 100 to 500 micrometers across. Right? So those are standard uh, grain sizes for a sandstone, and then the pore spaces are a fraction of those grain sizes. Therefore, I need typically uh, on the order of two to ten microns. Uh, resolution is really useful for resolving pore spaces in sandstones. Okay. If I want to image carbonates, I need even better, especially for microporosity, which is often sub-micron. Okay. So for that, you will often have to go to microscopy, uh, the scanning electron microscopy. And if I want to do uncommercials, which is right now something uh, that is a booming area, you have to go do way better than X-rays, essentially, in terms of resolution, and we will review those as well. Okay, so again, uh, I've spent speak, uh, talking about this last time uh, before. So thin sectioning is one of the most traditional, just a brief review. That's basically polishing a surface, uh, uh, thinning, uh, taking a very thin uh, sliver of, for instance, sandstone, just putting it in. Uh, slides and then using a uh, microscope to uh, look at the images and by polarizing light one can actually do different types of images that reveal different details in mineralogy okay micro models uh, are basically manufactured often etched in glass but they could also be etched in plastic materials like PVMS and you fall through them, as you can see, under a microscope, so you can basically inlets and outlets on a, what's called microfluidic chip, and you fall through them and visualize that in the microscope. We will see that process on Wednesday, so I will not, uh, but there are various review papers here listed if you're interested. What I could also do within those uh, micro models is velocimetry. Uh, and that has been quite uh, popular. If you're interested, there is a link here to uh, one of the latest papers on velocimetry in micro models. But it's essentially putting a particle that you can track in your image because it's often the least fluorescent. Literally, think about it like this. The particles that you're going to see here fluorescent are way smaller than this, and they flow. Well, they're not going to necessarily fall out here, 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 here,
that you have, but it can be actually done in optically in this connection, pretty much like this, it's a smaller scale. So it can be done in three as well, as long as it's something that is not too stories from the picture by index matching. And you can also, uh, again, uh, probe, it's often done in sphere packs, just like this. So this type of media is often more of the media, so you can't necessarily use it in the actual type of uh, measurements are in model rocks only. Micro models or some sort of sphere packings that are, have been index matched. So you can kind of take the solids out of the view. So there's, um, Moroni has done quite a bit. There's a nice little paper that, little paper. Not little, uh, but it's one of the starting three-dimensional studies uh, for this type of. So basically, let's see if this, huh? whoa. Uh, so you can see from the displacement, you can essentially then with correlation, uh, correlating these closed positions, you can get the velocity of the fluid from. So that's essentially, so these are your seeded particles. And again, that can be done in 2D and 3D. And that gives you the velocity vectors and velocity fields within the porous medium, which is uh, very useful for different types of study. Okay. Now, if we move on further with optical measures in microscopy, uh, the microscopy typically um, focuses on a single point. And as a technology progresses, we can focus on it. We can focus better and better. That said, whenever you have from above and below. And that can be confusing. So let me see. So um, in different types of uh, micro, uh, microscopy can fall over slide field. Slide is relative. They're called two microns slide. <laughs> or it could be four or five. So this is basically the plane you're focusing on. So the information for one you get from here is sort of averaged over two microns. But you will, because of transparency, you see a little bit of things in the middle and above. Okay. So if you have something fluorescing, there will, there's stuff that is fluorescing from uh, below, uh, below this plane as well as the plane itself. Okay. So when you technically take a selection through some object, okay, you cannot, whatever is inside of this volume, you cannot necessarily see separately it's in that projection or the image that you're looking at and that's important to know so of course the thinner uh, the selection is the better it and less super uh, position you will get now here are some examples of uh, uh, of images and then a little bit earlier than this because i was involved in some of this work so the objective was to see where colors go so there were spherical particles that are here outlined because of these different things that are outlined them. Okay. And there were fluorescent colors. And the question was, are colors attaching to fluid fluid interfaces or fluid solid interfaces? And there were two different uh, fluids in there. And this is the, the difficulty of seeing that you can see fluorescent particles these are probably these are probably from the plane you're looking at, but some of these are from the plane below. 
but you will still see fluorescence. So you cannot disengage what's the multiplicity of the then the question is, well, are they your interface or interfaces? <laughs> So that's the so the, the, the assumption here. So there was an air and water here, and these were the solid beads. So there is some of this interface between all three, air, water, and solid. And the question is, are these stuck here? Or are they going to move through? So it's a little hard to tell from this. And that was sort of an open question that was relatively left open because at the time couldn't assemble three-dimensional images of something. So something to uh, think about. So again, when you have uh, things fluorescing, they're going to fluoresce. So it's very hard to tell whether all of these points, are they just in water phase in the middle of a phase? Or are they stuck on some interface, for instance, some water-solid interface because where the colloids get stuck, especially in environmental engineering, is very important because colloids think about E. coli spreading in a watershed, right? <laughs> so they're important for health. So you want to know where do they get attached or how do they get swept through? Uh, and where do they sit, like what type of interfaces, if it's interfaces, do they sit on? And can an interface actually sweep them away as you're flushing things out? Now, when we use this with fluorescence, these are the uh, typical images that are used in communication contexts. They come from biology, <laughs> fluorescence <laughs> materials in geosciences. You're not going to win uh, any. Uh, contests uh, in beautiful visualization. Oh, it's <laughs> a skeletons of creatures. But basically, though, uh, these colors typically come from uh, they're sort of faint colors that come from coloring the images. So that's something to think about. Right. MRI can be quite useful. Uh, has anybody done MRI for medical purposes? No, <laughs> well, uh, basically, it's a, res a resonance magnetic field present in the nerves. And as you are uh, as you are turning back, as you are taking back from alignment with the magnetic field, there is to be more activity in the So, magnetic materials, of course, respond to that, but so uh, so does uh, so do. Um, so that's often water, and water we uh, have in there. And you can also do, this is a pretty fast, uh, uh, fast the way it happens, especially if you have relatively clean materials such as these materials. And then you can actually do a temporal study rather easily. Temporal studies are now uh, uh, available for x-ray as well. well depending on the resolution. So downstairs, what we saw on Monday, you can do a temporal study with X-ray, and that's commonly done. But if you want a very fine resolution on micron scale, then that requires a much more powerful X-ray source. Okay. In MRI, it's relatively easy to design these uh, contrasting uh, tracers, and you can get an image somewhat faster. However, the resolution is which is only somewhat useful for natural material, natural porous materials. You can do sphere pack studies uh, where you can basically design your size of the sphere, but not so much. So this is an example of an MRI study where basically there was a water front going through uh, an image. In, in time. So this is something, so this is a 3D image of water flow after one fourth of a, or 0.25 of pore volume was injected and then 0.4. Okay. So this is something that can be useful. Now, the moment you have this ferromagnetic field, which will send and send and send, so it will have, like Julia said, some will have so far, 
that has magnetic components, then that can obscure your image and uh, not produce such a quality image. So if monitoring water, or sometimes uh, if you have a reaction that will create water, that can this can be useful. Um, however, um, if, uh, if you want detailed uh, reaction in something like a sandstone MRI is not an option. So that's why it hasn't been used uh, a lot in petroleum engineering. A little more uh, often used in, uh, in environmental engineering studies where sphere pack is a very good model. Okay? Now in medicine, it's quite common. Uh, you can see different tissues, basically uh, depending on different hydrogen or water content. This is your main tissue called heart. Uh, Boston, but this is actually my heart. <laughs> so I was, uh, I did not have any heart problems. I didn't go to the doctor for that. But I was good friends uh, right at school. I had good friends in biomedical imaging, and they needed data. So I went into an MRI <laughs> to give them <laughs> some data. And there was a once, yeah, I spent about two hours at an MRI. It's a very claustrophobic uh, experience. But you can also do tagging. So what's often done in these studies, uh, you can do what you look at the magnetic type of tagging. So as the heart expands, uh, you can measure the strength of the expansion of the heart, uh, which happen in time. The only trouble with that is that you have a superimposed heart motion and uh, breathing. Uh, so basically the movement of the lungs. So for all of these images, I had to constantly go and hold for <laughs> So yeah, after well, two hours of that, I was done. I, I did it once and I was, <laughs> I spent my good All right. So again, MRI can be useful for anything that has water. Uh, it's not very good for, and it can be spatial and temporal. Below 10 microns, and for materials like, such as sandstones or natural materials that might have magnetic components, very, very widely used is scanning electron microscopy, which essentially uh, takes a system of polished surface or non polished surface, but basically you uh, shoot an electron beam from a source. And then you detect. And what you can detect, so every time you can either a wave or a electron B, there will be interaction with the mass. That interaction with whatever material you're imaging will for one scatter, it, it will scatter some of that beam, and you can record that. During the interaction, there might be some electrons or some other type of particles produced, depending on the energy. And you could also have some x-rays, for instance, emitted. While during the interaction, the electrons in the material will change, possibly, uh, position in the atom and where they stay. And that change will result in emission of some of the x-rays. So during that interaction, you can basically record back how does it feel. Uh, okay. And you can also try to record some transmitted electrons if your sample is thin enough. So if it's thin, it will some of it will go through. But if it's not thin, it will scatter back for the most part. So there is sort of um, there has to be some sort of detector of electrons that scatter. So this is uh, very common. It is also hard to, I mean, electrons will go through, they will go, if I have a dwarf's medium, they will go somewhat deeper into the dwarf spaces. But it's also harder to say what is precisely in this top plane of the image. There will be some of the information that will detect in this sort of mixture. Um, nowadays, um, I'm just going to introduce this before I show examples. So nowadays, uh, we also have what's called focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy, 
focused iron beam part. Again, because that's what's polishing my surface. That is basically shaping off part of the surface. And that can be done in a previous since uh, 2005 or so, since some of the first papers in 2006 and 2007. Essentially, you can polish the new the polish the basically the removal layer of material, but then scan it in, removal layer, scan it in, and the scan will be the image. The field of view is very small, but you can go down to nanometer resolution. So for unconventional, this is very, uh, uh, very common. So it's a little hard to see over here, but basically you have a mount where you put your sample and this ion beam is polishing and then you shoot electrons and image what scatters and keep going. So this is an example image. This is successive two images that are 200 nanometers apart. Again, this is one of the earliest examples from three, uh, 2007. This is a carbonate. So this is microporosity within carbonate at three nanometer resolution. Okay, so that's what um, that's what's kind of what we're talking about. Oh, and this is actually uh, one image with the shocking effect. This is a three-dimensional image a sample. Uh, this is a shale sample. And you can also see that they identified the porosity in red, kerogen network in yellow, and the rest were solid. So I can get quite a bit of information. However, the field of view is rather small. These days, this is what I call series. Some of the latest generation of essays connect to my knowledge of the university. There is one at the University of Houston. So you can have each of these tiles one essay each. And there is up to 91 big per new tile. So what in a regular SEM is one image. Have a working at the same time, and a sample of tile damage. In my lab, Dr. Chris Landry, he does that the same, but he basically moves over and see it over a larger area and assembles a tile damage as well with one of these. And there is a software that stitches those images together, such as here. You can see the lines. So the problem with these images is, A, they're large. This can be 200 gigabytes in size. So right now, the problem is that, yes, you get an image where people can process it. And this is what I, at the beginning of this course, I said, the, what we can image is way better than we can process in terms of volumes that we can easily process. None of them, none of you have that powerful laptop, and I doubt that you have a desktop <laughs> available with this much memory. So just even reading in an image is a problem. The second problem is unifying. So, okay, somebody can stitch those together. Let's say that they have done a good job. So this is called image registration, right? So these beams will produce an image, but then you have, kind of have to match it. Uh, across those. So let's say that was done. You can see a little bit of shade difference because clearly there's 91 electron beams. They're all coming from the same power supply. Not all of them will be precisely the same shade of energy. And different energy levels will do the slight differences in shading. Technically, there is no Material change from this side to this side. Whatever mineral this is, it seems to me it's the same mineral. Look at it. Yes? And crystal structure here. So this is the same mineral, however, I have two shades of gray. As we will see when we start analyzing, in any kind of analysis, I assume that that shade of gray, whatever the gray is, maybe it's extra attenuation, maybe it's 
a sort of like transmission something. Yeah? I'm assuming that the same shape of gray is the same type of material. That's my assumption. And this can create problems. So how do I unify those that you see? Uh, across all of the images. And that's uh, part of the grayscale image processing that we're going to get to. However, it's quite amazing what we can, so you can actually get to millimeter scales with nanometer um, resolution. Here it's actually, for example, one centimeter scale, scale as for the but that's what's currently. So I don't think this is what we need to actually uh, get a heterogeneity. So that's something in less than three hours. That's pretty amazing on itself, uh, by itself. Um, and again, Lori Hutton at University of Houston has these type of images, but the processing of them is problematic. Okay. If you create a sliver keen enough for the same electron beam to go through, then you have transmission. Otherwise, it's scattered back. So then they're scanning transmission electron microscopy, and of course your detector has to be positioned accordingly. So there are some Kirogen images um, that are shown. So this is a type of image through a Kirogen um, experiment done with uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy, and basically showing these pores that are less than two nanometers within Kirogen. I still have a hard time in my <laughs> brain processing these as pores, or rather, yes, okay, it's some sort of fibrous material. Uh, I don't know that I uh, think about it as a porous material in a traditional sense. Kerogen for me is basically filling some of the porosity, uh, but in itself it has another porosity in it. All right. Uh, one more type of uh, radiography is, uh, so just before I finish, so all of these are somewhat destructive because I have to either polish sample, and if I do three-dimensional images, it, it is destructive because you have to kind of shake all of the IOP. Now, uh, radiography, neutron radiography is essentially, it's non-destructive because you're using neutrons. And principle is similar to X-ray CT uh, type of beam. Uh, however, neutrons can see more details. This is neutron radiography image, this is X-ray. However, having the source is so you have a little bit of better penetration there is a better variation between different chemical elements all x-rays really tends to see is density of the material so if you have for instance calcite versus quartz you're not going to see much variation in x-ray because they're singular density Whereas this would uh, basically recognize. It has also great sensitivity to hydrogen. But I do have quite a bit, uh, you ha I have to have long exposure times, and it is hard to have a uh, source in the lab, which is why it hasn't been uh, as developed as X ray. Here is an example. Uh, for rock study, uh, if you're interested, uh, since it's sensitive to uh, to hydrogen, it's also monitoring water going through, uh, or any kind of water, something else interface, as long as that something else doesn't have hydrogen. Uh, now we come to X-rays, which we will go to our second uh, visit today. Um, <laughs> for our planned 115 takeoff from this class. So basically, why do I want to do X-ray? Part of it is, and everybody has at least, even if you're a healthy bunch, you fly. <laughs> so, um, more likely than not. 
So these are the sort of X-ray projections. And again, what that X-ray in, uh, uh, in any kind of uh, airport is looking for is higher density material, right? <laughs> Which is metal. So it's really metal detection, right? So I'm going to easily spot metal uh, on a person. Um, but basically what I can also probe, so this is a very quick scan. And in terms of the energy that it delivers, is not a lot. However, if I want three-dimensional information, I have to, as we mentioned last time in the X-ray lab, take multiple projections. So this is one projection. I either have to rotate my sample or rotate my set of source and detector around the sample to get those projections. And then from projections, we're going to go uh, into a little bit of more detail after these introductory slides. From those projections, I can reconstruct three-dimensional image without destroying the sample, which for imaging people is very important. <laughs> you know, uh, so it can uh, be destructive depending on the level of energy used. So the one uh, that we are going to see today, if you deliver that type of en energy to a person, you will kill a person. So we don't resolve humans to the micro. <laughs> okay. We re resolve humans only with the millimeter. Uh, millimeter. Uh, now, this is a relative formation. Synchrotron is a pretty powerful source, and you can get five to ten minutes per scan, even less, especially for materials that are relatively simple, like glass. Uh, however, the heavier the material, so the moment you have a sandstone, uh, this is not necessarily going to be um, as fast. And when I say 5 to 10 minutes scan, um, I didn't mention whether it's this one projection or multiple projection. Okay. So I cannot yet, other than with the most powerful synchrotron image of sandstone, comparison is only 5 to 10 minutes. But I can't now, it's, uh, for any kind of lab-based source, those will be slower. But again, they're getting better and better. So these numbers don't take them in absolute sense. It depends both on the material that is used and whether you're in a synchrotron or you are in a function of lab study. But just to give you some ideas, the reason why I need to have that idea is if you're interested probably in transport processes or some sort of uh, something that is happening to a rock core, so if you want to, whatever it is that you're interested in, it's just going to be static for that amount of time. So you can stay in the time while you're standing for a rock because the metal core is there. And uh, other than, no, there's no sample preparation other than core. If I were to image this sensor, I should basically core it to the size or to the volume that I want to. That way, I'm avoiding wasting my cell energy on imaging stuff that I don't want. Now, this is also a part of the limitation is because we cannot, we could technically get very good resolution even on a sensor better than one micro, in theory, by the core. This that I'm destroying it down to. And most of the time, we're going down to one to five microns. There are so-called nano CTs. I think it's one micron. Again, our big problem is the sample size. And I imagine you're a researcher. You want to know something about the fluid movement in a core that is less than millimeters in size. What do you do? <laughs> First thing, first, you lose your sample size. <laughs> <laughs> because it's too small to see, right? So even if I can go in that under resolution, it's extremely fine to work with small sizes because 
the small. <laughs> so handling those. And other than that, you can do even on a micro scale, when I'm imaging a micro scale and I have several millimeters, I can actually arrange a new core slot. Carefully, but it can be kept. There's no need to do any kind of index matching. And this has been uh, developed and commercialized, and it started in 19. Uh, so, well, X ray started in 1895, but those were mostly projections. This is the similar scanner to the one we've seen. Those uh, have been constructed in the 60s and 70s, and then adapted uh, for research in porous materials as well. Those are so and they're um, produced and can be produced in a lab setting in a ga uh, glass bulb of an X-ray tube. And you have two electrodes and one is basically um, taking any high atomic vapor material times that is pretty common and exciting it. And those, that's your X-ray source. Okay? And then... Uh, Basically, those uh, X-rays will produce uh, th that uh, beam will produce the X-ray that ultimately goes through the material between source and detector, and, and you get attenuation. You measure attenuation across the beam. Synchrotron is something like this. So basically, you're accelerating electrons on this. This is a kilometer perimeter. You can ride a bicycle around. And then you're just taking, these are the stations. These are all the stations. And working with them. Okay, so these are highly accel accelerated el electron beams, and they're steered with magnets to get into uh, each res um, research station. Okay? And there is the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, that you get in those, and it's higher energy. So you can penetrate deeper and with better resolution. Okay? Now, commute this, how do I actually reconstruct the image? Depends on this, what we call uh, geometry of the setup. Again, where is your source? Do you have a point source? Where is your sample with respect to the detector? And based on that, um, those types of beams. If I have a source that is more powerful, and I have a detector, this is basically parallel beam that is going to be the material. Whereas if I have a point source, I have, I have sort of like a curl. And that's important for reconstructing the image and uh, how knowing what is the geometry of the sample and the geometry of the beam is important for ultimate three dimensional reconstruction. Let me just uh, get through the resolution and this quick introduction, and then we can go. So medical scanners can do, do 200 to 500 micron resolution at best. Industrial scanner is a little better than medical in terms of re resolution, so it's going to go down to 50 to 100. So this is the one that we visited last time. And then today we're going to, this is not synchrotron, but uh, microtomography scanners uh, can go down to 1 to 50 microns. Now, the technique has started in 1987 for porous materials, this three-dimensional reconstruction. This, uh, was then, uh, so this was a nature paper in 1987 that allowed for three-dimensional reconstruction of images. And then it was, after that, it was applied to porous materials. The first paper analyzing these images 
And I am here to assist the plan of this. Essentially, he started working with some of these images that were in, uh, obtained in Brookhaven National Lab on Long Island. And Soderbrook University is uh, 20 miles away from there. So these are the, some of the first papers on reconstructing images. Okay. And then the fluid uh, analysis on microtomography, I already showed these images, has started in the, the first paper in 2000. And after that, it's going to <laughs> so back in the day, around 2005, you had, this was the group Stonerbrook, well, the images were done uh, by John Dunsmuir, who worked in Exxon at Brookhaven National Lab, and all of these people were analyzing the images. Uh, C. Wright was the chemical engineering during the experiments. My advisor was in applied math trying to image, uh, trying to analyze images. Dorothy Wilden Schultz still works at uh, Oregon State University, and Mark Rivers did imaging at Australian National University Group started with the study in the lab. They analyzed some of the synchrotron images, but some of them they started playing with these in the lab, and a lot of technology lab-based technology was developed. And this is uh, Quinn Wilson in, uh, at Louisiana State. And this is Lee McCarvin uh, in Maryland at Penn State University. So there was like basically uh, just a few years. I was still, uh, still PSU. <laughs> and uh, 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 and uh, ANU in Australia. And uh, uh, Oregon University. So there's like five or six groups back in the day, and now kind of everybody does it. So. At UT Austin, we have seen the lab of Dr. De Carlo. Today we're going to see the lab of Dr. Espinoza. There is a UTCT, which is essentially NSF, National Science Foundation Supported Facility at Geosciences, which there basically you send uh, samples and you just there to the facility. The ones here that are in the department, they're more working on, like, they're within a research group, so they're primarily focused on imaging work that is done at this department and collaborations of this department with others. Right? This is actually a facility that you can walk into, and then there are patients that can do imaging for you as long as you can and if you want to know more about, uh, there's the UTCT, that's the Geosciences Lab. It's very good on materials. If you're interested, you can definitely go and read about them. Um, Mark Rivers uh, has one of the first, I think this is from 1998, the online <laughs> reconstruction image uh, acquisition and reconstruction of the beam line at the uh, National Lab near uh, Chicago and then up. And then there's a review paper that is relatively recent on in general on X-ray imaging. We're going to probably assign this one for some sort of a homework reading. However, it's a dense paper because it reviews all kinds of history. Okay? So this is where you can uh, read more I would like you to know that Richard Ketchum, uh, he's director of UTCT, he teaches a digital rock petrophysics course that is more focused on actual acquisition of images and how to get a better image. Uh, the last one, uh, or first and last, was offered in spring 2019 as a graduate level course, but he, they also offer short courses, both on taking the images and their analysis. If you're ever interested, that might be something to pay attention to. All right, with that, I'll stop with this uh, intro and let's go see what.